Hello there, welcome to MA Fight Club and Never Hedge Media. We're breaking down PFL number four coming up this Friday, the 17th of June with a 7 p.m. Eastern start time. This event's being held live in Atlanta, Georgia at the Overtime Elite Arena. There'll be 10 total bouts on the card. This is part of the PFL regular season, so the athletes are looking to add their points together in, in hopes of eventually qualifying for the playoffs. The main event will feature a battle between Clay Collard and Alex Martinez. The co-main event's going to be Antonio Carlos Jr. versus Bruce Soto. 10 total bouts on the card, no female bouts. So if you're not doing anything on Friday night, here you go. You got some mixed martial arts for you the day before UFC fight night. With that said, we're going to jump into it with the prelim card, work our way up all the way through the main card, give you a really light breakdown of the fighters, give you our favorite picks to win. At the end, we'll give you a summary of our picks and also give you our betting picks in terms of who we're going to bet, how much we're going to bet, and also our parlays. All right, guys, with that said, let's jump into it. Here we go. First fight, the prelim card's a lightweight battle at 155 pounds between the Brazilian fighter Bruno Miranda, who goes by Robusto, and Nate Nasty Gentleman. Gentleman is 15-5 and five overall, 3-2 in his last five fights. He hails out of Wisconsin, 29 years old, 6 foot in height with a 71 inch reach. He trains at a Rufus Sport Mixed Martial Arts Academy. As for Miranda, who goes by Robusto, he's 14 and 3 overall, 5 and 0 in his last five fights. He's now based out of Thailand, where he trains out of Tiger Muay Thai, 32 years old, 5 foot 9 in height, so about 2 inches shorter than his opponent. We don't have a reach number on Bruno. Having watched him in the film, his arms don't look very long, so I imagine the reach advantage will be on the side of Nate. Now, looking at the numbers on Tapology, it appears that Miranda is a big favorite, getting 93% of the votes, with only 7% coming in for Gentleman. I do agree. The current money line has Miranda as a favorite as well, at minus 270, with Nate Gentleman at plus 230. In my opinion, Miranda is the better overall mixed martial artist, more power in his hands, has a better ability to finish, training at a very good gym at Tiger Muay Thai, has a winning streak going, all the arrows point towards Miranda putting up the win here. From what I saw from Nate Gentleman on film, I was not very impressed. A bit slow at times, a bit plodding. He will have a reach advantage in this matchup, but the quickness advantage will be the side of Bruno Miranda. The biggest weakness I see for Bruno Miranda is the ground game. He's not very proficient on the ground. He prefers to fight in the feet. As for Nate Gentleman, his biggest issue is boxing defense. With Bruno Miranda, who throws a lot of power, if Nate Gentleman is not careful, he can get knocked out here. Now, this will be the toughest competition for Miranda. This will be the second fight for Miranda in the PFL. Now, Miranda last fought in March of this year, where he beat Carson Frey by a round three TKO. His prior fight was three years before that, so had about a three-year layoff between his last two fights. As for Nate Gentleman, his prior fight was in January of this year, where he beat Austin Lechin, and that was an NAFC. So this will be the first fight in the PFL for Nate Gentleman. It'll be a step-up in competition for him. But when you look back at Nate Gentleman's profile, you do see some names back there you recognize. Damon Jackson, currently in the UFC. Kevin Kroom, he has a win over him, also currently in the UFC. So he had some nice wins in the LFA. He has some experience, but it's just my opinion, again, that Bruno Miranda is the more explosive fighter, more knockout power, better finishing ability. Over the course of three rounds, will land the better shots. If there's a path to victory for Nate, it's going to be through technique and landing more punches and staying at range and not getting too hurt. Nate's decent on the ground, but I don't believe he's strong enough or quick enough or powerful enough to take advantage of Bruno on the ground. So I like Bruno Miranda to win the fight here. At minus 270, he'll be a parlay piece for me. The two props that I like the most would be Miranda by TKO and Nate Gentleman by submission. When you look over Nate Gentleman's topology, he does have some chokes in his resume. Could he get Bruno tired here? Bring it to round three, maybe get a choke at that point? Yes. I'm not going to be betting any props in this fight. I'll be taking a piece of Bruno Miranda straight up at a half unit on the money line, and I'll also be putting him to a few parlays. That's your breakdown, guys. I like Bruno Miranda to win the Next fight. Next up, we have a light heavyweight battle at 200 five pounds between Martin Hamlet and Josh Silveira. Josh Silveira is undefeated at 8-0. He's based out of Coconut Creek, Florida, where he trains out of American top team. 29 years old, 6 foot 1 in height, but we do not have a reach number on him. As for Martin, he's 9-3 overall, 3-2 in his last five fights. He's based out of Norway, 30 years old, 6 foot 1 in height with a 75 inch reach. He trains at a Frontline Academy. According to the money line, Silvera is a slight favorite at minus 140. You can get Martin on the other side at plus 120. I like Silvera a lot in this spot. He's one of my favorite picks in the card. And at minus 140, these guys are very similar. Similar in size, almost the same exact age. Both coming out of pretty good camps, though I would give the advantage to Silvera coming out of ATT. Now, Silvera's undefeated, obviously, has not lost yet. But when you watch the film of this guy, very athletic, very good ground game. Martin Hamlet, who just fought earlier this year, his last bout, he got a ground and pound or pound-ish kind of win. Didn't do much pounding, did more laying and praying, had position control the entire three rounds, got a nice comfortable win, but he can't do that here to Josh Silvera. That's not going to work. Silvera is very good on the ground, very proficient. I believe he's the better wrestler overall. On the feet, he's more explosive than Martin Hamlet. At minus 140, ton of value here. I imagine the money line is much closer because Martin Hamlet's been around for a while. He is a veteran of the sport. People know who he is, but I just don't see him having enough here for a more explosive fighter in Josh Silvera. Now, they're about the same age, but when you watch them fight on film, Josh Silvera just comes off as the more explosive, younger fighter with more energy. Martin Hamlet's more of a plotting fighter, not quick on his feet, boxing's okay, needs to grapple, needs to grab, usually wins by position control, can be a little boring at times. Now, as for the prop I like the most in this fight, Josh Silvera by submission. He has a ton of submissions already, and Martin Hamlet, his last two losses have been by submission. Hamlet, like I said, likes to wrestle, 
but his grappling defense, not so great. This will mark the second fight in the PFL for Josh Silvera, who fought earlier this year in February, got a rear naked choke win over Mohamed Juma. For Martin Hammett, he's coming off of a decision win in April over Teodoros, who was a first-time PFL fighter and a guy who's quite green. But again, in that match, he takes down this young fighter, keeps him down the entire time, position control. Prior bouts lost to Antonio Carlos Jr. last year via rear naked choke, and then also lost last year to Corey Hendricks via rear naked choke. So to me, again, the path to victory for Josh Silvera, if he's not going to just get control time and get a decision win, it's most likely by submission. And for Martin Hamlet, it's going to be hard for him to control a guy who I believe is a better grappler. And of the eight career wins for Josh Silvera, five of them are by submission. So again, I like Josh Silvera to win the fight. I like it by submission, most likely round two or three. At minus 140, a lot of value here. I'm going to take Josh Silvera to win the fight. That's the breakdown, guys. Next up, we have a UFC veteran, Rob Wilkinson versus Victor Pesta. Victor Pesta is 18-7 overall. He's 3-2 in his last five fights. He's an underdog in this matchup at plus 240 in the money line. He hails out of Czech Republic. The Czech Republic, isn't that where our buddy Yuri Prozhashka is from? Anyway, he's out of Prague, Czech Republic, 31 years old, 11 months, so about to be 32. Six foot four in height with a 77. Of entry. He trained out of Sanford MMA. Very good gym. As for Rob Wilkinson, who goes by Razor, 14 and 2 overall, 3 and 2 in his last five fights. He's a favorite on the money line around minus 335. He's based out of Sydney, Australia, 30 years old, 6 foot 3 in height with 80 inch reach. He trains out of Hybrid Training Center. As for the votes on Tapology, Wilkinson is a huge favorite, getting 91% of the votes, only 9% coming in for Pesta. I totally agree with the public. I like Wilkinson to win. This guy is a former UFC fighter, if you don't know. He had a decent run in the UFC, had some tough losses, fought guys like Israel Adesanya, got knocked out by him, but still was in there with some of the best in the world. To me, his pedigree, his experience, striking, everything about him is better than Pesta. We don't know much about Pesta, but we saw Pesta just fight recently. He got knocked out in a minute and 25 seconds in round one against Amari Akhmedov. Amari Akhmedov is not an amazing boxer. He does have some power, but what you saw in that fight was that Pesta didn't have any head movement. It was like a deer in the headlights. Did not look very comfortable. Looked very much out of sorts. Now, his prior fights had some decent wins, but they were all lower level promotions. That was his first fight in the PFL, and he got cold clocked in round one. That was back in April of this year. It's been about two months now. He's coming back in here against a fighter like Rob Wilkinson, who in my opinion is even better than Amari McMedal. The best version of Rob Wilkinson beats Pesta every single time and twice on Sunday. Rob Wilkinson went 0 to the UFC before coming over to the PFL. He's now 1-0 in the PFL. Good boxing background still takes part in boxing and kickboxing matches if you look on tapology you'll see he's still active in those sports but the bottom line is rob does everything pretty well a very good striker very durable can take some punishment and has a ton more experience here than victor pesta at 18 and 7 victor pesta has more total mixed martial arts fights than rob wilkinson but so much less experience and against much lower level competition i like rob wilkinson a lot in this fight he's one of my favorite picks in this entire card i'll be parlaying him i like him by tko but if not by tko no problem by decision over the course of three rounds the cream will rise to the top he's a much better striker much more well-rounded more experienced the price is not great but it does make sense he's a much better fighter than victor pesta and coming off that last fight pesta did not look very good so i'm sure the money line is being impacted by that recency bias so i'm taking rob wilkinson the win i like the former ufc fighter at minus 310 i love the price and that's my pick that's your breakdown guys okay next up we have a light heavyweight bout between emiliano sorti and delon monte monte is eight and two overall three two in his last five fights a dog here at plus 245 in the money line he hails out of brazil 28 years old six foot in height we don't have a reach number on him he trades out of evoluca Thai MMA. As for Sorty, who goes by He-Man, 23-10-1 overall, 2-2-1 in his last five fights, a favorite here in the money line at minus 330. He's based out of Argentina, 31 years old, 6 foot 2 in height with a 77 inch reach. He trains out of Alliance MMA and also United MMA Fight Center. As for the votes coming in on Tapology, Sorty is the big favorite, getting 90% of the votes, only 10% coming in from Monte. I do not feel that confident. I think Sorty probably wins the fight, but if you watched his last fight, man, it was not a very good outing. I feel like people just didn't watch that fight or maybe forgot it happened. So his last fight was in April of this year against Corey Hendricks, a round two ground and pound loss. He just simply did not look very good in that fight. He got his leg beat up. Corey Hendricks is a pretty good fighter, but nowhere near the level of what we imagined Sorty to be at. And in that fight, Sorty was a big favorite on the money line. So it's a big upset loss for him. His last three fights, two losses and a decision draw. So he's not a very good streak. I don't know why people are backing him so heavily here. I like Sorty. He's a very good mixed martial artist, but he showed a lot of wear and tear that last fight. Did not look very good. And to me, like a guy who's getting battered and bruised, didn't look very good at all. That's just my opinion. Now his opponent here, Delon Monte, he also didn't look very good in his last showing either. He lost in under 30 seconds to Antonio Carlos Jr. via a Darce choke. Now, when you look at Delon Monte, he's jacked, big guy, right? Not very flexible, kind of uh, uh, type of dude, kind of like a He-Man, even though Sorty calls himself He-Man. In any case, he's got bulk, got mass, got power. For Sorty, he's the more technical guy. We'll have the better striking ability. We'll land the more combinations. We'll have better movement. 
but man, that last fight, Sorty did not look like himself. He didn't look very good. So I'm going to choose Sorty to win the fight, but I'm not betting this fight at all. And I wouldn't blame you if you want to take a sprinkle on Delon Monte. I'd like Delon Monte more to bet on him if I saw him fight a little longer against Carlos Jr. But the fight was over so fast, I couldn't see much. From that standpoint, I don't have much to go on. At plus 245, he's giving you some plus money, but it's not outrageous plus money. Sorty probably wins the fight, probably gets back on track here. But at 31 years old, man, he looked like he was 41 in his last fight. Did not look very good. I would implore you before betting on him, look at the last fight. You'll see what I'm talking about. Now, granted, it's recency bias, but his last three fights, he hasn't got a win. A draw and two losses. Again, Carlos Jr. was mixed in there, and he's a tough fighter. I'm just saying, a guy at 31 years old, Showing some wear and tear. I'm not rushing to the window to put money behind that. So I'm choosing Sorty to win the fight. But at minus 310 to minus 330, not touching with a 10-foot pole and not parlaying it. I encourage people who like Delon Monte, look further into him, find more film. It could be a good dog for you to play. And that's my break. Next up, we have a lightweight battle between Natan Schultz and Marcin Hell II. This is a rematch and probably one of the toughest fights to call the entire card. This was probably going to go down to a split decision. They fought before. It went to a close decision. It probably goes to another close decision again. As for Natan Schulte, he goes by Russo, 21-5-1 overall. 3-2 and two in his last five fights. A slight favorite here at minus 160 in the main line. He's a slight favorite in this matchup at minus 165. Based out of Brazil, 30 years old, 5 foot 10 in height with a 69 inch reach. He trains out of American top team. As for Marcin Hell, 27-8 and eight overall. 4 1 in his last five fights. A slight dog here, plus 130. Based out of Poland, 30 years old, 5 foot 9 in height with a 71 inch reach. He trains out of Bastian Tichy. As for the numbers coming in on Tapology, Marcin held it's a slight favorite, getting 62% of the votes and 38% of the votes coming in for Natan Schult. I do agree. I'm picking Hell to win the fight, but that's only because of two very small reasons. One, Natan Schult has shown recently to be in a little bit of a skid. After being dominant for the last few years, he started to hit a bit of a rough patch. Secondly, Marcin Held did win the prior fight. So if you're going off of past history, a close fight, he got the edge the first time, probably it's the edge this time as well. But it's going to go to decision. It's going to be close. It's priced perfectly. It's a pick em. If you like Natan Schult in the rematch, great. You're getting some value there. If you like Marcin Held, even better. You're getting more value at plus 145. For Natan Schult, he's 1-2 in, in his last three fights. Not a big deal, but the point is the guy was on a streak there for a while. Could not lose. Now the last few fights kind of ran into some bumps in the road. He fought earlier this year in April, lost to Olivier Mercier by split decision. A close fight. His prior fight, Alex Martinez, won by split decision. So the last two fights have got a split decision. And his prior fight before that was last year in April, about a year ago exactly, he fought Marcin Held and lost the fight by decision. So last four fights actually for Natan Schult have all got a decision. Hasn't been dominant. Hasn't been the fighter we used to see. If you go back to 2019, he's got multiple finishes being more dominant. I feel like the field has kind of caught up to Nishan Schultz. And at this point in his career, he has to make some changes, adjust some things. He's got to add some more tricks to his bag to be a little more effective. Now for Marcin Held, he has not fought this year, but his last loss was also to Mercier. So they're both coming off of losses to Mercier. And his prior opponent before that was Nishan Schultz, where he won by decision. Both of these guys are similar fighters. They're athletic. They're good on the ground. They're good in the feet. They're not amazing anywhere. Very durable. They don't cut. They're going to go the full distance. What's going to happen here is going to come down to who lands the bigger shot over the course of three rounds, which I believe I'm going to give the edge to Marcin Held. I think Marcin Held takes a few more chances. One of my recent critiques of Natal Schultz is he's too laid back. He doesn't push the tempo. It's like he doesn't want to get too much of a firefight or like he thinks he won rounds and he didn't win. And so at times in the fight, I believe he kind of goes into cruise control, whereas I expect Marcin Held to let loose a little bit more, maybe take some more chances and maybe Natal Schultz can take advantage of those opportunities. But still, over the course of three rounds, if it's close, I'm going to side with Marcin Held to at least do a little bit more to get the eye of the judges. I have no confidence in this fight, guys. It's going to go down to a decision. It's going to be very close. Probably a split decision. I'm not going to bet it. If I had to choose a side, I'm going to choose Marcin Held to win the fight at plus 145. It's probably the better side to be betting on anyway. That's the breakdown, guys. Next up, we have a light heavyweight battle at 205 pounds between Omari Akhmedov from Russia and Theodoros Akstulas from Lithuania. I'm just going to call him Theo for the rest of this breakdown. So Theo is 11 and 6 overall, 2 and 3 in his last five fights. A big underdog here at plus 385, 30 years old, 6 foot in height. We don't have a reach number on him, but having watched his prior fights, his reach would be comparable to his height. So I'd say his reach is about 70 inches. He trades out of Pancras Jim Sweden. As for Amari Akhmedov, who goes by Wolverine, he kind of looks like Wolverine. He's got the beard and the shaved mustache. Anyway, 22-7-1 overall, 2-3 and three in his last five fights. He's a big favorite in this matchup at minus 525 on the main line. He's based out of Dagestan, Russia, 34 years old, 6 foot in height with a 71-inch reach. He trades out of Dag Fighter. As for the votes coming out of Tapology, Akhmedov, as you can imagine, is a big favorite, getting 97% of the votes, only 3% coming in for Theo. I do agree. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this Theo character. If you're going back to just the last fight, you're not going to be very impressed. He lost to Martin Hamlet. He got grounded and pounded. Didn't get much damage on the ground. More just got position controlled. Couldn't get back up. Showed terrible stand-up offense. 
showed terrible takedown defense, and just looked completely out of sorts. And it was his first PFL fight. And most of us had not really heard of this guy. And so you're watching him in that one vacuum of a fight, and you're like, this guy's terrible. Very awkward, robotic. And when you first glance at him, you're thinking, Omari oh, Akhmedov's probably going to run through him, knock him out, finish him, position control, get an easy win, right? And that's what I think is going to happen. And at minus 525, Amari should do that. Amari's coming in here after a nice KO win his last fight earlier this year as well. But here's the thing. There is a but. When you go back in a topology of Theo, you start seeing some names that kind of like pop out to you. And you're like, whoa, wait a second. He fought this guy. And then there's one that really pops out to you. And you're like, wait a second. He knocked out Bruno Capaloza in round one in 2015. But go back and watch that fight, and you're like, wait a second. The path to victory for Theo is to simply catch Omari with a big overhand right. Omari doesn't have great stand-up defense. He gets a little bit wild, and if he wants to get into a striking exchange, he opens himself up, and I can see Theo landing something kind of crazy and shocking Omari in the spot. So what I'm telling you is, I think Omari wins the fight. At minus 525 to minus 550, not a ton of value. I'll parlay it, but I'm not going to over parlay it. My fear is that 34-year-old Omari Akhmedov will slow down a bit in round three. So if we get to a round three, and Theo seemed to be pretty durable in his last fight. He's not easy to finish. If anything, to finish him, the best path would be through submission because he gets a little sloppy on the ground. But it's not going to be easy to knock him out. So if we get through round two, we get to round three, 34-year-old Omari Akhmedov, who gets a little bit slow at times, gets a little bit sloppy, doesn't have the best endurance, could Theo then catch up to him in round three and hurt him, maybe finish the fight, or maybe get some ground and pound, some kind of finish. He is four years younger. He's fought some decent competition. He does need a bounce back. So if you're looking for a long shot dog on the card, I think Theo might be a guy to look at, but the numbers suggest that Amari wins the fight. And if you're watching the most recent fights of Theo, he did not look very good that last fight. He looked completely out of sorts. Very bulky guy, very strong, but Martin Hamlet just rode him for three full rounds, and this guy had no answer for it. Yeah, I'm not high on Theo at all, but the price tag is a little bit scary. He does have an overhand right. He's knocked out some good guys, but his career is very up and down. Had like a three-year layoff between his last two minutes martial arts fights, so I'm not really sure. Is he like halfway in, halfway out? Is the PFL like searching for guys, fishing for guys out there that may want to come in for the season? Is he the kind of guy who's just got body this year? But Amar Akhmedov is more proven. We know who he is. He has more than almost triple the amount of mixed martial arts experience. He should win the fight. At minus 525, I'm going to have him as a parlay piece, but I'm not going to play him straight up. That's your breakdown. All guys. right, up to the main card. We've got Jeremy Stevens versus Miles Price. Miles Price goes by Magic. He's 11 and 8 overall, 3 and 2 in his last five fights. He's based out of Ireland, 34 years old, 6 foot in height with a 75 inch reach. He trains out of Team Ryano MMA. As for Jeremy Stevens, who goes by Little Heathen, he's 28 and 20 overall, 48 total fights. He's 0 4 1 his last five fights, bit of a rough streak, which we'll talk about. He's a big favorite, though, in this matchup at minus 550 to minus 590, depending upon what book you have, Matt. He's based out of San Diego, California, 36 years old, 5 foot 9 high with a 71 inch reach. He trades out of Alliance MMA. As for the numbers on Tapology, Jeremy Stevens is a huge favorite, getting 93% of the votes, only 7% coming in from Miles Price. I do agree. I like Stevens to win the fight. When you first look at his topology, you're like, oh my gosh, hasn't won a fight since 2018. But man, had a bit of a rough run. He fought a lot of good guys. And his last few fights in the UFC were against guys like Calvin Qatar, Matez Gamrot, Yara Rodriguez, Zabit Magomed Sharapov, Jose Aldo, Yara Rodriguez twice, actually. So the guy has fought some pretty tough fights. Now, his first fight in the PFL was back in April of this year. He lost by decision to Clay Collard. Not a bad loss. Look, Clay Collard's a very effective veteran boxer striker. Tons of boxing experience. It was a good matchup. Very close fight. Lost my decision. But this match appears a little bit different. Miles Price coming off of a massive layoff between his last two fights, almost three years to be exact, comes in against Anthony Pettis in his last matchup. I thought Miles Price had a chance to win the fight. I was wrong. Anthony Pettis choked him out in round one pretty easily. And what it showed me was that, number one, Miles Price definitely had some ring rust. Okay? Hadn't fought in a few years. You got Jeremy Stevens, who, for whatever you want to make of the guy, used to be in the UFC, 48 total mixed martial arts matches. In this matchup, he's the much more experienced fighter. He's better in every which way, shape, or form. And it's finally time for him to get back in the winning column. This will be a good matchup for him. And for Miles Price, has not been fighting very much the last few years. Jeremy Stevens has been in there with some of the best in the business the last few years. He's got the advantage every which way, shape, or form. Now, my concern is the money line. At minus 525, there's just not a lot of value. Now, it's a parlay piece. There's some value. And I have some confidence in 36-year-old Jeremy Stevens. But, man, I wish it was more like minus 300. Minus 525 just doesn't add a lot of value to your parlay. And could you see him coming in here and going to a close fight? Now, look back at the fight when Miles Price fought Peter Quilly, and Miles Price got the win by decision. It was a close fight. You saw that version of Miles Price where he uglies things up, 
grapple control time, gets back control, makes things just messy. Could he do that here against Jeremy Stevens? Yeah. I just think Jeremy Stevens is much more fresher, has been fighting much more recently, is the better overall fighter, better pedigree, and Miles Price, not a good matchup for him. At 34 years old, he's no spring chicken either. So I like Jeremy Stevens to win the fight at minus 525. Don't love it, but I'll parlay it, and that's your breakdown, guys. Moving up the main card, we've got Roush Monfield versus Olivier Alba Mercier. This will be a lightweight bout at 155 pounds. Roush Monfield goes by Cavallo de Guerrera. He's 16 and 3 overall, 5 in his last 5 fights, a plus 150 underdog in this fight, which I want to talk about that in a second. This guy is frequently the underdog. Matter of fact, look at his last like five, six fights. The guy has been an underdog in almost every one of those fights. And he comes out and he wins. He won the PFL final last year, right? $1 million prize. Yet he's still an underdog in this fight here against Mercier. He should be favored in his spot in my opinion, but he's still an underdog. The guy constantly wins fights as an underdog. So keep that in mind. Monfield is 30 years old, five foot nine in height with a 73 inch reach. He trades out of Team Noguero. Very good gym down in Brazil. As for Mercier, he goes by the Canadian Gangster. He's 14 and five overall, three and two in his last five fights. A slight favor here at minus 180. He's based out of Montreal, Quebec, 33 years old, five foot nine in height with a 70 and a half inch reach. He trades out of TriStar Gym and H2O MMA. Height and reach wise, very similar, but there'll be a slight reach advantage for Mercier. And Mercier is about three years older than Roche Monfio. As for the public votes and topology, very close. Mercier is getting 44% and Monfield getting 56%. So the public's just about split, and I do understand it. I like Monfio in an underdog spot, but Mercier has looked very good recently, picked up some very good wins, looked very dominant in his last performance. He will have an overall size advantage on fight day. Has a three-fight winning streak against guys like Natan Schultz, Dara Horcher and Marcin Held. And of course, Omar Mercier is a former UFC fighter. So he's got UFC credentials. He's on a three fight winning streak. He looks very good recently. A lot of reasons to like him. But man, Roush Monfio hasn't lost an MMA fight since 2018. Yes, four fucking years. His winning streak has included wins over Jolton Luderbach, Anthony Pettis, Clay Collard, Luke Radzibov, and Don Madge. In my opinion, has fought the better competition recently has been on a nice winning streak, and as a slight dog in most of those matchups, I like Malfield to pull it out again. Now, here's my big concern for Malfield. His last fight against Don Madge, he was losing most of that fight. He had low output, gets a knockout in round three for the comeback win, and it looks good on paper. And so for that reason alone, even though I like Roush Malfield in, in underdog spots, I'm going to choose Auburn Mercier to pull out a split decision win here in this matchup. It's going to be close. It's going to come down to the scorecards. I think Mercier does just enough. At minus 180, I'm not going to touch this fight. I'm not going to bet it straight up. I'm not going to parlay it. I think it's going to be very close. And I think if I bet on Mercier and then Mafio ends up winning, I want to kill myself because I keep telling people Mafio at plus money is always a great bet. So in summary, I'm choosing OAM to win the fight. That's your breakdown, guys. All right, we're up to the co-main event. Antonio Carlos Jr. versus Bruce Soto. Bruce Soto is 15-4 and four overall, 4-1 four in his last five fights. He's a huge underdog in this spot at plus 500. He's based out of Brazil, 32 years old in 11 months, so about to be 33. 5'10 in height with a 70 and a half inch reach. He trains at a full house. As for Carlos Jr., he's 14-5 and five overall, 4-1 in his last five fights. He's a minus 835 favorite in this spot. He's based out of Salvador, Brazil, 32 years old, 6'2 in height with a 79 inch reach. He trains out of American top team. And according to the public votes in Tapology, Junior is a big favorite, getting 98% of the votes, only 2% coming in for Soto. I do agree. I'm going to give you a little bit of an angle here, though, okay? Even though I'm choosing Antonio Carlos Jr. to win the fight, not betting it at all, <laughs> not going to bet this thing at all. That minus 825 price tag, not worth it, and quite frankly, it's not priced correctly. It's a mixed martial arts fight, anything could happen. You could put a small sprinkle on Soto, and here's the reason why. At some point, you watch Antonio Carlos Jr. fight. He's very submission dependent. On the feet, pretty good, tough not very quick, good striking, effective striking. He's a submission master, one of the best submission that makes martial arts fighter in the entire world, no question. But he depends upon that. You got a fighter here in Soto who's a Brazilian fighter. He's got a decent Brazilian jiu-jitsu defense. On the feet, I think he can catch Antonio Carlos Jr. I think on the feet, Carlos Jr. is robotic at times. I feel like his movement isn't great, and he knows that. That's not where he wants to fight. He wants to fight on the ground. That's where he fights well. But on the feet, I feel like he could be caught. He probably wins the fight, probably gets a submission. Now, Bruce Soto's coming off a loss himself in April of this year against Rob Wilkinson. Not an impressive performance, but it was his second fight this year, and this will be his third fight this year in the PFL. So Bruce Soto is very active. In his PFL debut in February of this year, he did get a win via a flying knee against Travis Davis. So I guess what I'm telling you is that Bruce Soto shouldn't be completely slept on here. If you want to go dog hunting, this is another spot that I like. Like, I like Amari Akhmedov to win his fight, and I like Carl Jr. to win his fight too. But with those price tags being where they're at, they're just kind of begging you to take a sprinkle here. So I'm going to put something on Bruce Soto to win the fight. Nothing too crazy, nothing aggressive. But again, you can't really bet on Tinder Carlos Jr. in his spot. The price tag precludes you from doing so. He probably wins within two rounds by submission. Looking back at the recent topology for Antonio Carlos Jr., look at his most recent wins. Darce choke, rear naked choke, decision, guillotine choke. The guy is a submission master. So for Bruce
Bruce Soto, he will have to escape and stay away from submissions for three rounds. If he can keep it on the feet, strike a distance, land a few powerful shots, then things are different. But man, it's going to be so hard. Antonio Carlos Jr. is a wily veteran. He knows how to get things to the ground. He'll do Amari rolls. He'll do whatever it takes to tie up a guy, leg locks, whatever is necessary. He'll backpack. So over the course of three rounds, I think he gets it done. But I'm going to put it out there again. He can lose his fight. And last week, we talked about Shevchenko's fight. I felt that Santos had a good chance to beat her. Now, granted, Shevchenko still won, but man, it was close. These big money lines, when they come across, you got to take advantage of the plus money. So again, I'm going to pick Carl Jr. to win the fight, but I will bet a very small amount here on Bruce Soto. That's your break. And the main event for PFL number four is going to be a lightweight battle between Clay Collard and Alex Martinez. Martinez is from Paraguay. He's 9-2 overall, 3-2 in his last five fights. A slight dog here at plus 130. He's now based out of Las Vegas, where he trains out of Champion Gym. He's 28 years old. Six foot in height with a 73 inch reach. As for Clay Collard, who goes by Cassius, like Cassius Clay. 21 and nine overall, 4-1 in his last five fights. A slight favorite at minus 160. He's also based out of Las Vegas, where he trains out of the Pitt Elevated Fight Team. 29 years old, five foot 11 in height with a 73 inch reach. So height and reach wise, a small advantage in height to Alex Martinez. Age wise, about the same. They both do most of their damage on the feet. If you know Clay Collard, excellent striking background. Still does some professional boxing on the side and has amazing hands. As for Alex Martinez, very well rounded. Good kicking game, good striking game, and has a very bright future in mixed martial arts. Now looking at the votes on Tapology, it appears that Collard is a big favorite. Getting 91% of the votes, only 9% coming in for Martinez. I do agree. I like Collard a lot in this spot, but the money line has me a little apprehensive. I would have thought Collard would have been like a minus 250, maybe even minus 300 favorite. I like him a lot in this spot. And yet he sits at minus 160 to minus 170, and it makes me nervous. Like, do the books know something? I don't know. Am I underestimating Alex Martinez? On film, Martinez is okay. But he's fought 11 total fights compared to 30 fights for Clay Collard. Not to mention Clay Collard has also fought some boxing fights. It just seems to me like Collard has this guy more outmatched everywhere. Now, neither guy's an amazing grappler, and the fight should be mostly on the feet. But on the feet, I like Clay Collard. Not to mention, Clay Collard has also fought the much better competition. So he's fought more fights, yes, but also fought much better fighters. I like Clay Collard a lot in this spot. I like him to win the fight by decision, if not by a TKO. He's my second most favorite spot to win outright and a popular parlay piece for me. If worst comes to worst at the end of the night, I might have a spot where I can hedge out and pull the parachute and bet on Martinez at the end of the night. He'll have some plus money. Now, if you look at Collar's most recent topology, it's not super impressive. He's got a lot of red marks there. Had a win against Jeremy Stevens in April of this year. Had two boxing matches he lost last year. Lost last year to Roush Monfio by decision, and that was in the semifinals of last year's PFL playoffs. Prior to that, had a win over Anthony Pettis and Jolton Lutterbach. So it's been up and down. He's lost his last four boxing matches, so boxing-wise, hasn't been going that great, but has a really good boxing foundation. His striking is amazing, very quick on the feet, good fighter IQ. Again, I like Martinez. I just think in this matchup, Clay Collard is the much better striker, much faster with his hands, will land the more strikes, and will land the harder strikes. Now, for Martinez coming in here off of a win against Stevie Ray by decision in April of this year, his prior fights from last year lost to Natan Schult and Lug Radzibov. Now, the Natan Schult would be a good fight to break down. He lost by a split decision, a close fight against a guy, Natan Schult, who doesn't push the pace. Clay Collard pushes the pace more, so Martinez will not have the luxury of trading back and forth at a slower pace or dictating the distance. Clay Collard will dictate the distance. He will lead the dance, and from that standpoint alone, probably leads the dance enough that on the scorecard, the judges will recognize that and give him those rounds. So I expect a close matchup. I think Martinez will do a good job. But Clay Collard overall to me, every which way, shape, or form when you compare it, is the better fighter. At minus 170, one of my favorite spots in the card. That's your breakdown. I'm taking Clay Collard to win the fight. All right, we're going to give you a summary of our picks and also go over our betting spots. So starting off with a summary of our picks. At the top, Clay Collard, Antonio Carlos Jr., Olivier Aubin Mercier, Jeremy Stevens, Amari Akhmedov, Marcin Held, Emiliano Sordi, Rob Wilkinson, Josh Silveira, and Bruno Miranda. The picks that we have the most confidence in on the prelim card we like rob wilkinson and josh silvera and the only spot that we have a lot of confidence in on the main card would be clay collard in the main event the two spots i would be very careful of betting on this card would be the co-main event antonio carlos jr and the amari akmedov fight against theodorus oxtostolis those two fights i get a feeling with those money lines being so out of control they could be the ones that turn upside down now the dogs that i believe that are live in this card to possibly win would be roush monfio at plus 155 Marcin Held at plus 145, and Delon Monte at plus 245. If you don't know already, all of our betting information is up on Bet and Mayotte Tips, where we track our bets. You can see when we're winning, when we're losing, our parlays, our props, our straight picks, the whole nine. So if you go up on Bet and Mayotte Tips right now, you're going to see this profile, which I'm going to regurgitate to you right here on this breakdown. So our straight picks to win, we're going to take one unit on Clay Collard at minus 170 to win. Josh Silvera at one unit at minus 140 to win. And for us, one unit is $100. Our first parlay for this car is going to be Collard at minus 170, Akhmedov at minus 525, Wilkinson to win at minus 310, and Silvera to win at minus 140. If you combine those four legs, it gives you plus 329. We put a quarter unit bet on that parlay. 
our second parlay. Wilkinson to win at minus 310. Silvera to win at minus 140. Kevin Holland to win at minus 240 from UFC Fight Night. And Stamen to win from UFC Fight Night at minus 510. If you combine those four legs, it gives you plus 284 odds. We put a half unit bet on that parlay. Moving on down, we have Akhmedov at minus 525. Collard at minus 170. And for UFC, we've got Qatar to win at minus 235. And Dacus to win at minus 225. If you combine those four legs, it gives you plus 289 odds. We have a half unit bet on that parlay. And next parlay, we've got Wilkinson to win at minus 310. From UFC, we've got Stamen and Holland both to win. Those three legs combined give you plus 124 odds, and we have a half unit bet on that parlay. And the last parlay will be a two-legger. Silvera to win at minus 140, and Collard to win at minus 170 gives you plus 172 odds, and we have a half unit bet on that. Once again, all those bets are available on our profile on betma.tips. If you go down here on YouTube in the description, you're going to see a link to that profile. So if you're not doing anything on Friday night, we've got some PFL action. It starts at 7 p.m. Eastern. It'll be available on ESPN+. Plus. The event's taking place live in Atlanta, Georgia. So it'll be in front of a live audience, which would be nice. 10 total bouts on the card. No championships, of course, but it's part of the PFL regular season. If you're not astute to what that means, look into it. It's a pretty cool format. You kind of like tabulate points with the regular season. Then whoever gets the most points, whatever, moves on to the playoffs and so on and so on. Uh, some good fighters on this card, some former UFC fighters, but overall, some exciting fights that I'm looking forward to. If you're not betting on it, just want to look at the fights, that's okay too. And if you are betting on it, best of luck. We'll see you guys soon. Enjoy the fights.